2023 laid out before us, our commission is to walk daily with the Lord. To walk moment by moment with the Lord. And, and how many of you know it's one thing to walk with the Lord? How many of you know it's another thing to walk with the Lord and do the things that the Lord would do? And I believe with all of my heart in this, in this very first day, this very first Sunday of 2023, that as your pastor, my job is to commission this house to be about the Father's business. When, when I received a flyer in the mail in regards to uh, this conference at the end of February that, that some of us are going to be going to. And listen, if, if you haven't signed up, I want to encourage you if, you, if you feel like God wants to do anything in your life besides have you warm the chair you're sitting in, I want to encourage you to go and to be a part of that. It's a great time for the Lord to minister to you personally and when 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 i received the flyer in the mail for this conference it stunned me to read the statistics that were on the screen a few moments ago and if you missed them let me tell you what they are since just since the pandemic don't tell me that the devil does not hate the church don't tell me that the devil's plan is not to stop the church, to destroy the church, to stop the moving of God. When just since the pandemic, one out of every three Christians have disengaged from their church. One in three. What motivates that? Fear. I can't go to church. I'm a little older than I used to be. If I go to church, I might get sick. Somebody might sneeze on me. Somebody might cough on me. The pastor might get too close to me and spit on me when he's preaching because I can do that. It's the splash zone. One in three Christians disengaged from the church. Well, I can still be a part of the church by just sitting at home and watching over the internet. Well, let me just put it to you this way. You're watching a program on the TV screen or on your computer screen. You are not necessarily connected to what we are connected to by being in the house of the Lord. Yes, the Holy Spirit can invade your house. Yes, the anointing of God can come into your house. Yes, you can sense the presence of God in your house, but there is no substitute for fellowshipping together with the brethren. No substitute. It is a ploy. Listen, I fought having the internet, and I listen, I'm not busting on you on the internet right now. I'm not. There are those of you that are housebound. You can't get here. But there are also those of you that are watching that could go get in your car and be in this house this morning. But because of convenience. Because of convenience sake. I, don't, I can watch the... I can be in church in my underwear. I can, I can dance like David before the Lord in worship. Listen, two things. The Bible says don't forsake the fellowshipping together. And, and another thing is that the enemy wants to separate you. And if he can keep you separated from the flock, you are vulnerable you are easy prey. Listen, when you miss that first Sunday, next Sunday is going to be a lot easier to miss than last Sunday was. And by the third and fourth Sunday, it doesn't even harm you a bit. You're just like, well, yeah. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good, people. One in three Christians since the pandemic have disengaged from the church. I'm calling the church back together.
In 2023, listen, I am calling the church. I'm asking you in 2023, do not let anything stop you from being in church. I'm not looking for attendance. I'm looking for effective men and women of God that will put aside their cares and their wants and their desires and make Jesus Christ, Almighty God, number one in their life. And no thing is going to stop me. My trip to the river can be done on Saturday, but Sunday I'm going to the river of God. I'm just, I'm just, I, I, this is not in my notes. One in three Christians disengaged from the church. 4,000 American churches closed. 4,000 American churches. Oh, that's right. There's a plus sign behind that, so it's more than 4,000. Somebody do the math for me. If there was 4,000 churches that closed during the pandemic, and let's say the national average of churches is a hundred people. How many people have lost their church? Listen, I'm not looking for new math. I'm looking for the old school math. I've got 500 different answers. Okay. 4,000 people? Would somebody just tell me the number? 40,000. <laughs> 400,000 people today don't have a church. Let that sink in just a moment. Don't think for a second that the enemy is not rejoicing over the fact that 400,000 people have lost their home church. Let me ask you this. Where are you going to go if this church isn't here? Four thousand plus American churches. Two, uh, Twenty thousand plus pastors have left the ministry who's feeding those sheep 20,000 pastors church we got to fight the fight We've got to stay in the battle. Listen, I've spent 2022 fighting just to stay in the pulpit. You don't know that, but I know that. Because of battles, personal battles that I fight within myself. And it would be real easy to just, well, in the natural, it would be real easy to just say, you know what? Somebody else come pastor this church. I'm just going to go hide off out in the brush somewhere. I'm going to go get in a, in a nice new truck and just go trucking all over the, the United States and somebody else can worry about it. And I'll just have my time with the Lord in my truck. That ain't what God's calling us to. That's not what God's calling me to. He is not calling you to come to church and sit on the back of your lap and listen to me go on and on for an hour. My job is to equip you, and if you'll listen, and if you'll take notes, and if you'll engage, and if you'll worship, God will begin to speak to your heart. If you'll put yourself around people that are on fire, you will catch on fire. The main thing that I believe that Jesus would do is meet the needs of those he came in contact with. Newsflash, by the way, how many of you know who Kyle is? Kyle, 
Kyle's one of those guys that have, has been in and out and in and out and in and out and in and out. And God started getting a hold of him. And he was standing. He, I remember him. Last time I saw him, he was standing in the back, both hands raised, looking off out that way, worshiping the Lord. Haven't seen him since. I've prayed. I've worried. I've done all those things wondering where he's at. I know where he's at. He's in Roseburg in a rehab center getting his life straightened out church we got to pray for that young man he's just one guy but what could god do through one guy that gets completely fired up for jesus we need to pray for that guy now we know where he's at he's doing his part we got to begin to meet the needs of those people that we come in contact with because that's what jesus would do remember when jesus went to the funeral Screwed the whole thing up. <laughs> Let me see in there. Guy just sits up. Whew. That's a good nap, but I'm ready to go. Remember when Lazarus was in the tomb? Mary said, listen, Lord, he's been dead for four days. Surely there is a stench. I love the King James. He stinketh. <laughs> Jesus said, open the thing up. And he stood at the door and he said, Lazarus, come forth. Church, have you ever needed to be rescued from a life-threatening situation? Have you ever been in a car accident? Have you ever been near drowning? Have you ever been inflicted with some kind of a disease? Some other crisis that could have easily snatched your life away? Even if you have not personally confronted death, most of us know someone that has. When we think about life-threatening situations, we must all face the crisis of sin in our life. Maybe you've got a good handle on the sin in your life, but what are you doing to help your neighbor get the sin out of their life? And I'm not just talking about saying, you are, you are just a rotten sinner. I'm saying, hey, how can I help you overcome that? How can I pray for you? How can I, can I teach you some things? Can I mentor you? Can I disciple you? Whether or not we acknowledge the sin or deny it, it does not change the reality that sin will doom us to eternal death. But unless you have something from inside of you that begins to well up and you are convicted and confronted with the sin in your life and you come before the Lord and say, God, I'm a mess. He wants your mess. He's concerned about your mess. The devil wants to just stir your mess up. Jesus wants to take your mess away and replace it with order. He wants to take somebody that is as messed up as Kyle is messed up and get him in a place where he can get some things ironed out in his life and reinitiate him back into the church and make a difference. He will stand out like a new penny. Why? Because of what the Lord has done. We are all gripped, church, by the hand of sin. We've all been held in bondage by its power. And it doesn't make any difference how much we try to keep from sinning. We discover that we still do wrong and we still come up short. I know what I'm talking about because I'm preaching to me this morning. I fall short. Too often, I succumb to the pressures of sin too often. I lose my temper too often. I get out of sorts too often. I only have one alternative, and that is to come back before God and say, God, forgive me. Again, you were just here yesterday, the devil will say. Maybe you were here five minutes ago. Jesus is asking us to come unto him. All you who are weary and heavy laden. 
Not just those of us that have got our ducks in a row. Not just those of us that have seemingly got it all worked out. He wants those of us that are a mess. Because I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. A little boy heard that song. You heard the testimony. And because of that song, he got baptized. And when he came out of that water, he was a different kid. You ever watch him worship? You can be just as awesome as he is. All you got to do is what he's doing. That's pretty simple, isn't it? I forgot to pray, didn't I? I got, I got wound up. Yeah, I got wound up, Lord, but the reality is it's you that cranked me up. It's your fault. Father, I pray right now, God, that nobody would feel beat up on by me for the things that I've said and the things that I'm going to say. But God, the things that I've said so far, I believe with all of my heart, have been spoken under the unction of your Holy Spirit. When Jesus began to call out the Pharisees and the Sadducees and call them whitewashed sepulchers, full of dead men's bones. I'm pretty sure he hurt some feelings. When he looked at one of his hand-picked disciples and said, get behind me, Satan, Peter might have got his feelings hurt had he not known that he was right. I'm praying today, God, for your anointing. To preach like I've maybe never preached before. To declare the truth of your scripture. God, to not just read a, 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 a text. To not just read uh, some script that I have put down on paper. But God, you would speak through me. Lord, that your people would be under your anointing this morning. God, that the anointing of God would break and destroy every yoke of bondage off of their life. That as they have worshipped you today in this place, oh God, the plow of heaven would, was buried, the subsoiler of heaven would be buried deep in our heart and break up the fallow ground. Lord, that is laid dormant. Lord, that the, the nutrients and the water and the, the air have, have, have just skipped over it because it's so hard. But God, your, your plow has broken up that ground and now water and, and oxygen and seed can get in there and begin to produce a crop. God, let it be so today. I give you all the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, we cannot achieve perfection no matter how diligently we try I've been to the Holy Lands I've been to Israel I've seen the uh, the 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 uh, the Jewish people that are still bound up in Judaism They've got their phylacteries and they've got their little prayer boxes that they wrap a cord around their head and it's on their forehead and they've got them on their arms and they wrap them around their arms. And, and even in the airplane as we were flying to, to Israel, when, when there were those of them that were on there that were, were, were old uh, Orthodox Jew people and they they would at, at, at a certain time they would just get up out of it didn't matter if the seatbelt sign was on or not they didn't care about whether breakfast was being served or not they got up they went to the back of the airplane they faced toward the east and they began going through all their religious formalities doing everything that they could 
to attain some level of, of acceptance and, and perfection under the law. And thank God today, church, I could sit in my chair and I could worship God, whether I was looking north, east, south, or west. I could eat some biscuits and gravy on the airplane, glory to God, and know that I'm still going to Jesus. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But the one who saved you is perfect. And he wants to work on you and I. But God will not invade us if we don't let him. You can sit in your house with, with sickness and die in your house by refusing to go to the doctor. You can get up out of your chair, go see the doctor, get some medication, whatever the case may be, and begin to feel healthier in your life. You can sit in the condemnation of the devil and say, I've just been too bad for too long. I've messed up too many times. There's no hope for me. The the devil has got my number, and I just cannot get victory over the sin in my life and you can cave into that you can let that rule your life and you can go straight to a devil's hell or you can let the Holy Ghost of God get inside of you and begin to raise up inside of you and you can look at the devil and say devil I'm done with you I might have blew it today but I'm going to get up this afternoon and I'm going to follow after the things of God whether you like it or not We come short. We cannot achieve perfection. It doesn't matter how diligently we may try. We are always coming short and failing to to some degree. But even more tragic is that we discover that we are gripped by death. We are gripped, church, by death. No human, short of the rapture, no human being escapes death. The grave is inevitable. The Bible says that the grave is never satisfied. Always got room for one more. That's why I'm hoping for the rapture. Amen. Glory. I think it's going to be a fun ride myself. I think it's going to be a a rush. I'm, I'm not much of a thrill seeker, but that's going to be what I'm signed up for. Amen. We come short. That we don't escape death, but the wonderful message of Scripture is we can be saved. We can be saved, church. The wonderful gift of salvation has been offered to you and I. We just celebrated the greatest gift known to man the birth of a baby, the birth of a Savior. Salvation from sin and death can be yours and mine. God sent the Savior, the Lord Jesus, and He provided for us redemption. And it is the great message that Isaiah, the prophet, proclaims in Isaiah chapter 61 and verses 1 through 11. And all through the New Testament, Jesus went on and He met the needs of individuals that He came across. When we see a need, what do we do, church? I think that's a good thing, but that also can be a cop-out. God, we're going to pray for you, brother. I'm naked and I'm hungry. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. Now go on, naked and hungry. Get on out of here. It's true. It's true. What would Jesus do? That's WWJD. Some of you are too young to know about that. Jesus would clothe them, feed them, and send them on their way. So what should we do? Jesus didn't say, I'll pray for you. He, listen, can I just be so Rude as to say, I'm going to take care of some of y'all's cop-outs. You know what a cop-out is? I'm going I'm to take some of them away from you right now. 
Because there's just some things you don't have to pray about. He done already told you in his word what to do. Oh, brother, I'm going to have to pray about that. No, no, you don't. You just do what you're told. You just do what you do. I'm not saying in any stretch that prayer is not vital. Prayer is absolutely vital. But there are some things that you have read about in God's Word that prayer ain't going to take away. Meet the need. All right, there you go. Whatsoever you have done unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done unto me. That's what she said. Jesus was always concerned about the spiritual condition of those that he came in contact contact with, but he never neglected their physical needs either. Isn't that amazing? He provided healing to the sick and to the oppressed, as well as food for the hungry. I remember being in a church, and and the pastor stood before the congregation, and he said this. He said, listen, if if you've fallen on hard times, and and you don't have the money that you maybe need or, or would like to have, do not, I don't want you to give to this ministry. Keep it for yourself. And I thought, man, would I love for you to show me that in Scripture. What if... I'll do the preaching. All right? Listen. Settle down. (laughs) I know it is, for sure, because that's exactly where I'm going. Actually, I'm not going about the widow's might, but I am going to the widow woman that was out gathering a few sticks to build a little bitty fire for her boy and for her to bake a cake and eat it and die. That's the story. What are you doing? I'm gathering some sticks, and I've got this little bit of meal and this little bit of oil, and I'm going to bake a cake, and my son and I are going to eat it, and then we're going to die. I don't know if you've ever read that story and thought about what it is that you're reading. How desperate were they if they're going to eat this cake and death is at, not at the door? And the man of God comes to town and in his audacity said, Listen, lady, make the cake, but feed me first. What? She did exactly what the man of God told her to do. And because of her undying obedience to the word and to the man of God, she never went without from that day forward. He will take care of our needs. I believe that in this coming year, we are going to have opportunity to meet some of these same kinds of needs as the Lord brings people into this place to have their needs met. Listen, if we're not here to meet people's needs, what in the world are we here for? This is not a country club. We are not building a golf course. We're not even building a clubhouse. We're building a hospital for sick folk, for people that need a place to go and find love and compassion and to maybe get some needs met. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 through 11. I'm going to ask you this morning if you'll stand with me as we read this passage of Scripture. Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 11. The Spirit of the Lord, 
The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prisons to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified, and they shall rebuild the old ruins, and shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. And the sons of the foreigner shall be your plowman and your vine dresser. But you shall be named the priests of the Lord. They shall call you the servants of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory you shall boast. Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. And instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess double. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offerings. I will direct your work in truth and will make them w- make with them an everlasting covenant. Their descendants shall be known among the Gentiles and their offering among among the people all who see them shall acknowledge them and they are that they are the posterity whom the Lord has blessed it will i will rejoice greatly in the Lord my soul shall be joyful in my God for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation hallelujah he has covered me with the robe of righteousness to God be the glory and as a bridegroom decks himself in ornament and as a bride ordains herself with jewels so for as the earth brings forth its bud as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Listen, church, I don't know what that passage of scripture does for you, but it gives me hope. Amen. It gives me some hope, man. Listen, let me tell you, in, Ma- in uh, the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke records in chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus speaking now. He said, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. 2023, folks, is the acceptable year of the Lord and it is our job to get the word out, the good news out, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ, man. Amen. Oh, Lord. Listen, what I, I, I was talking about plowing and, the, and all that kind of stuff. And here he is talking about the same thing out of this verses of Scripture. We are a garden. A garden. If you plant corn, guess what? Corn's coming up. If you plant tomatoes... You're not going to get apples. You're going to get tomatoes. Because seed produces after its kind. How many of you know this morning that you have within you the seed of righteousness? You have within you that you are a garden. You have in you a seed, and God this morning is wanting to begin to water those seeds. And he's beginning, wanting to begin to fertilize that seed. Fertilize promotes, to fertilize promotes growth. Now they got all kind of chemicals that, that, that are fertilizer, but back in the day when I was a kid, we used something else for fertilizer. Maybe that's why I have blossomed so much. Because I've had that fertilizer from one end of me to the other. And I have... 
And I, I have since blossomed. Listen, when I was a freshman and sophomore in high school, I was a whopping 106 pounds. I was, a, I was an animal. I have blossomed. <laughs> Church, this passage in Luke sets the tone for the entire theme in Luke. Jesus is concerned both for the spiritual restoration of people and their actual physical needs. How can I, how can I help you, brother? Listen, I, I got this, I got that, and I got the other. Well, I'm going to pray for you. It's going to be all right. How about just meeting their need? I'm not saying we always need to just give people money. In fact, the reality is very, it's very seldom that I will give someone money. But if I meet their need, I know that that need is getting met. Because temptation too often can dissuade somebody from getting their need met and having their flesh satisfied. Do you see the difference? Jesus was concerned for both the spiritual restoration and the physical needs of his people. Jesus is just beginning here his, his Galilean ministry, and as was his custom, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And Jesus read from this very passage of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 61. He read verses 1 and 2, and the words of Isaiah picture the deliverance of Israel from exile in Babylon as a year of jubilee. <laughs> Woo, boy, would I love to have a year of jubilee. Huh? A year of jubilee. Do you even know what the year of jubilee was? Let me just help you with it. The year of jubilee was when all debts were canceled, and the church said, Amen. Woo! Man. Doesn't that sound great? All debts are canceled. All slaves were freed. <clears throat> Come on, man. All property was returned to its original owners. Think about that. But the release from Babylonian exile had not brought the fulfillment that the people had expected. They were still conquered and they were still an oppressed people. But Isaiah was prophesying of a future messianic age. He was prophesying about a time when one would come in the spirit of the Lord. He would be in fact anointed to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor, freedom to the prisoner, and recovery of sight to the blind, the release of the oppressed, and begin to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I'm here today to fulfill part of that prophecy because I believe with all my heart whether the devil likes it or not I've been anointed to preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to lay hands on somebody and see their eyes opened up to see their ears unstopped and to see people set free from the bondages of sin and hell. Come on! 2023, it can be just another mark on your calendar, or it could be the year that God does dynamic things through your life. Woo! I'm going to preach before it's over with. All I can tell you, church, all I can tell you is that that is the very message that we have, that we are obligated by Almighty God. That is the message that God has handed down and He has commissioned us to deliver to a people who are just that desperate. Do you believe that? Do you want to be a part of that? Glenda talked about... Um, what are them? Uh, New Year's thing. Resolutions. Resolutions. I'm not a big fan of res resolu re 
resolution. I almost said revolution. <laughs> hey, hey, that's a whole different deal. It's a whole different deal. I'm not a fan of resolutions because resolutions oftentimes are only an avenue for disappointment. Come hell or high water, glory to God, I'm going to lose weight. Pass the potatoes. <laughs> Grandma baked me a pecan pie. Hey, hey. We set ourselves up for failure, folks. But here's a, I think there's a difference between a resolution and a declaration. I'm declaring by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God, that as He gives me unction, I'm going to speak. As long as I have breath, I'm going to sing. I'm going to preach. I'm going to declare the glories of Almighty God. It don't make any difference whether you like it or not. I'm going to declare it. It doesn't make any difference like the prophet Jeremiah. I don't care if I don't get one person saved. They're not going to be able to stand before God and say, well, He didn't tell me. You're just an easy target. <laughs> Church, we got to make some declarations. And we got to stand by those declarations. Because here's the problem. When we make a declaration, the enemy automatically, instantly goes to work. And he begins to round up his little imps and he calls a meeting and he says, listen, here's what they, they have declared that they are no longer going to miss church on Sunday. They made that declaration. No matter what, as long as I have breath, I'm going to be on ch in church. I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm going to listen to what the preacher says. I'm going to be there in the morning. I'm going to be there Sunday night. I'm going to be there Wednesday night. I'm going to be there Thursday morning for women, if you're a woman. I'm going to be there Friday night for men's, if you're a man. And the devil will say, well, yeah, but I thought you were going to go to the lake this weekend. Well, I was going to go to the lake, but I remember that I declared to the Lord that I was going to do this and I was going to do that. And let me just say this in the midst of what I've said. There are going to be times when you don't make it to church on Sunday morning because there's something that's been planned and you need to be a part of it. There are those times. But church, it needs to be the exception instead of the rule. I take a week off for elk hunting season because I like it. It's a t I always go far enough away, I don't have any phone service. It, it's, it sounds crazy, but it's true. And you know what's even funnier is last year everybody else was getting phone service in this secret little spot that we go to to get phone service, but I couldn't get phone service. Because it's a time when God wants to just let me disconnect from all of that. So there's going to be those times. I'm not saying that just so I don't have to feel bad about being in church. I'm saying that there are going to be those times, but it needs to be the exception and not the rule. I always feel a little almost guilty for not being in church that week. But I have to remember that even Jesus himself got away to spend time with his Father. Jesus began his ministry he began to quote these verses, and then he applied them to himself. And in order to fulfill his ministry, the anointing of the Holy Spirit was poured out on Jesus. His ministry always involved the preaching of the gospel to the poor, to the meek, and to the afflicted. And under the old covenant, God ordained the priests of Israel to stand between him and his people. And they brought God's word to a people and, and, and the people's needs and sins to God every year those folks had to be reminded of the mess in their life every year 
Thank God for the new covenant. Under the new covenant, all believers are priests of the Lord. The reading of God's word, the seeking and seeking to understand it, confessing their sins directly to God and ministering to others. Listen, we don't have to go get in a confessional box in, in, in any place and confess to a man our sin. The Bible does say it's good to confess your sins one to another. That's a different thing than having to go to the priest and confessing to the priest and hoping that the priest remembers out of 250 people in church that morning what you need forgiveness for, and that he's going to remember to take it to the Father. No, that curtain's been opened up, folk. We can boldly, according to Hebrews 4 and 16, we can come boldly into the presence of God and make my request known. I know that he heard my prayer because I went in there and delivered it my own self. Jesus came to break the bonds of evil and to, pro- and to proclaim freedom from sin and satanic dominion. You might still fight some battles, but you win the victory. Hallelujah. It's God's Word. John 8 and 36. Ha <laughs> ha! Therefore, what's it there for? It's therefore a reminder to you. It's therefore an encouragement to you. It is therefore that if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. That's so wonderful, Pastor. That's wonderful. Apparently, y'all ain't fighting the same battles that I'm fighting. Because I'm like, yeah, woo! (laughs) Come on, girl! Can I just tell you this, church? When Jesus walks into the room, I bet we don't just sit there and go, hmm, Jesus is here. (laughs) Anyway, moving right along. That was a clue, but... See, sin has a way of enslaving us. Sin that... Boy, I am just going to keep preaching. Sin has a way of enslaving us. It has a way of controlling us and dominating us and dictating our actions. It manifests itself in self-centeredness, in rebelliousness, in possessiveness, in dysfunctional love and addictive behavior. Can you you understand this morning that that drugs and alcohol are not the only things that you can be addicted to? I'm addicted to the dinner table, and it shows. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just telling you something. I'm addicted to food. You know what my problem is? I live to eat instead of eat to live. There's a difference because I love food. I can recognize that I'm full. I'm satisfied. I've had enough, but there's still some left. It's true. It's true. I weighed, I'm I'm twice the man that I was in high school. And that ain't necessarily a good thing. But it's true. Jesus can free us from this slavery that keeps us from becoming the person of God that he created us to be. You know what, Mike? Because you and I can relate to this. When I sit in my chair, it takes me a minute to get up. And once I do get up, I'm doing this. Across the floor. I look like I've got it going on this morning because I'm running all over the place. Part of that's the anointing. Part of that's because I've been up. But it's like rigor mortis sets in. 
It's like, oh, oh, oh. I just wonder how much of that, I'm just talking to me, but I'm going to talk to you about me. How much of that you reckon might go away? If I took care of some of that. My knees might not hurt as bad. My feet might not hurt as bad. My hips might not hurt as bad. My back might not. If I would just do what God's called me. Don't point your finger at me. It's true. It is so true. We need to have our finger pointed at us from time to time. I just like food too much. Maybe if I... I'm done. I'm going to bring conviction on myself if I keep it up. Listen. Even if sin is restraining, mastering, or enslaving us, it is Jesus Christ that can break the power and the bondage. It is Jesus himself that is the truth that sets us free. He is the source of the truth, and he is the perfect standard of what is right. He sets us free from the consequence of sin, from the self-deception, and from deception by the enemy. And he shows us clearly the way to eternal life with God. When I say that he can set us free from the consequences of sin, I'm not saying that he cancels the order. Because when you plant seeds, crops are going to come. I've already established that. But when you, when you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap the flesh. But when, when I say that he frees us from the consequences of sin, I'm telling you that sin no longer has mastery over your life, or it shouldn't have mastery over our life. It ought to be something that we are set free from because he has freed us from that. And he shows us clearly the way to eternal life with God. And so Jesus does not give us free... Listen, you have to hear what I'm saying, not just the bells ringing. You have to understand that Jesus does not give us freedom to do what we want. But freedom to follow God is what he has given us. And when sin begins to reign, people have no choice but to obey its evil desires because they are slaves to sin. And believers, as we as we as believers, we have died to sin, but as long as we live in our mortal bodies, there is going to be, because of your flesh, sin, nature, there's going to be a propensity to sin. There's going to be something of your flesh that says, hey, it's going to be okay. Nobody has to know. Until you look in the mirror. And all of a sudden, the mirror is screaming at you, I know. I know. Only because we have died to sin do we have the power to no longer let it reign over us. We are, in fact, free from slavery. But every day, you have to make a decision to reject the old slave ways. I cannot imagine what the slaves of old went through when they were released and when they were set free. I'm sure that that had to be a struggle. Much like a prisoner set free that has been incarcerated for years and years and years, they, have walked, they walk out of a prison cell into a world that is completely foreign to them. And most of them, I shouldn't say most of them, but a large percentage of them do something to get back in there because that's where they feel safe. That's where they know what the routine is. That's where they are accustomed to. And listen, church, I want you to understand, sin is very easy to stay in. Sin can be difficult for us to get out of. That's why I believe, like Paul, when he said, God, Lord, take this, this thorn out of my flesh. And, and the Lord said to him, listen, my grace is sufficient. 
There's things that I pray to God about all the time, and I'm still praying about it today because for some reason or another, he hasn't snapped his fingers, anointed me, touched me, whatever, and called that thing to leave me alone. I fight through it and fight through it and fight through it. We got to just keep fighting, church. Why do you say that, Pastor? All the time you talk about this, this stuff that you fight in your life because I want you to know that I am not arrived. I still fight battles. The enemy still hates me. Another important aspect of the anointing that the Lord received was for the opening of the spiritual eyes of the lost, that they might see the light of the gospel and be saved. Listen to me, church. You can have 20-20 vision and still be blind. You can have... 2020 vision and still be blind. The ministry of Jesus as the promised Messiah would focus on the calling of people back to God. My job as an ambassador of Jesus Christ is to continue to call people back and, and tell them about the, the, the mercies of God and the freedom that we have in God. That's my job, that's my commission. That's why I'm not going to go through some deep theological study about, about, you know, why camels have two humps. I could care less. I'm not going to go through all of the, the, the dispensations that it talks about in Revelations. I've got a dispensation for you. Get saved or get left. I'm, I'm not a theologian, I've never claimed to be, but I am a salvation guy. And I know one thing, if you, can, if you can settle the issue of salvation in your life and sin in your life and get right with God, all the rest of it is going to take care of itself. Amen. That I promise. Jesus fulfilled every prophecy that there was about him, but in a way, there are many of the Jews that, that were, but, uh, were, were unable to grasp it, and the, they pictured their Messiah as a conqueror who would set them free from Rome. Instead, he was a conqueror who would set them free from sin. John 10.10 10 says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Listen, Jesus Christ does not want you to be hamstrung. If you don't know what hamstrung means, to be hamstrung meant that, 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 you, the, that, that this tendon on the back of your ankle, this Achilles, if you cut that, you're finished. Your walking days are over. They might have the technology today to, to repair all that, but when you are hamstringing a horse in a war and in a battle and in an army, when you hamstrung a horse, that horse was done. That soldier's mode of transportation was over. He was on the ground. He just became a much easier target. And the enemy wants to hamstring us, church, but I want you to know God wants you to have a life of victory. Listen, the Bible says in Proverbs that it is the wise who win souls. Every one of us in this room this morning have, have been commissioned by the Lord Jesus Christ himself to go out and make disciples of every nation and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Jesus gives abundant life to his sheep and it speaks of a great gift of, of divine eternal life which is a life that becomes the possession of every believer from now and for eternity. If you'll settle the issue of sin in your life, if you'll settle the issue of where are you going to spend eternity, because every person on the face of this planet is living eternally right now. Every one of us. Saved or not saved. You're either going to live in eternity in the presence of the Most High God, or you're going to live in an eternity absent of the presence of God. Call hell whatever you want. The fact of the matter is, it was going to be a place that is absent of the presence of Almighty God. And that is what's going to make it hell. It's not the fire. It's not the stink. It's not the gnashing of teeth. It's not the bugs that are eating you that don't ever consume you. It's not the fire that burns you that you never burn up. It's the fact that God ain't going to be there. That's the problem. Jesus said, I've come 
that you might have life and that life more abundantly. Jesus would provide for his sheep eternal life that would cost him his own life. And in contrast to the thief who takes life, Jesus gives life. The life that he gives right now is abundantly richer and fuller. It lasts forever, but it begins today. Life in Christ is on a higher plane because of his forgiveness and his love and his guidance. Abundance of life points to depth of living now and length of living in eternity. How deep are you in Christ right now? Because church, if we're just scratching the service, we are not being fulfilled. We are not being prepared. I'm telling you, God wants to do something in your life that will far outweigh a trip to the lake. It will far outweigh a trip to Eugene, to the mall, or even to the Cabela's, or even to the Duluth Trading Company, or any place else you can think about that you want to go right now. I promise you, if you'll get fired up about what, oh my goodness, if you'll just let Jesus help you save, get something one person led to the Lord, you will be addicted. I cannot get enough of it. Sunday morning, if you weren't here, five people came on Sunday morning, on Christmas morning. They came unprovoked out of their own volition because the invitation was given because it turns me on. I might not have been wise in school. But according to God's word, a wise man saves souls. And I'm grateful for the opportunity that God has given me. Listen, it is clearly not a life that denies problems and pain. Listen to me. It is not. It is, it is not only a life as good as it can be, but it is also a life beyond what we can imagine. I said it a while ago when I was trying to get a good hooray out of you guys that when we walk into the presence of God, we are not going to go, hmm, he's here. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> I made it. Woo! I have a hunch there's going to be a bunch of folks that are stacked up like cordwood because they just can't stand it in the presence of God and they're just going to fall over. And we're going to get up. And we ain't going to give a care who's beside us, behind us, before us, or anywhere around us. We are going to begin to let a, a, a cry of worship flow up in and out of our bodies, out of our mouth, because it is a, a realization. I'm no longer asking to be in the presence of God. I am in the presence of God, and I can't hardly stand myself. We start running around in that place. I don't think Jesus is going to send one of the angels to go calm that guy down. Ron, just settle down over there. Mm. Jesus told his disciples in another place in Scripture, in this world you will have trouble. So removing any last hopes that he was, in fact, leading his followers into this life of guaranteed earthly happiness and prosperity, he removed all of that. Even the beautiful pastoral scenes that Jesus described through this chapter do not allow us to forget the danger of thieves, the presence of death, the daily hardships of coming in and of going out. In this world, we will have trials and tribulations, but in Christ, we can overcome them all. Every one of them. Your marriage is in trouble. In Christ you can overcome it all. You're sick in your body. Christ can overcome all of that. Your bank is, is, is a little bit low on money. You can overcome all of that. Because God said I shall supply every need you have. Not your wants but your needs. Mm. Listen. The wonderful message of this scripture is that we can be saved. There's no 
greater miracle. I have seen people healed and set free. I've seen devil, devils sent running. I've seen that kind of stuff. I've seen miraculous healings take place. Folk, there ain't no greater miracle, in my opinion, than to see a, a sinner that was lost and doomed for a devil's hell be transformed and transitioned into the presence of the Most High God and have their life secured for all eternity in the glorious riches of God in heaven. That is a miracle, that I could be born again. All the mess in my life washed away. By the blood of Jesus. In Christ we can overcome them all. The wonderful gift of salvation has been offered to you and I. I got news for you. Some of you guys got Christmas presents. I think. Some of your babies got Christmas presents. And they began to share, look what I got. Look what Mima and Papa got me. Look what Mom and Dad got me. Look what my brother, my uncle, my aunt, look what they got me. And we began to share. You want to play with it? You want to play with my truck? You want to play with my doll? Let me tell you about five people on Sunday morning that got the greatest gift for Christmas ever known to mankind. They got saved by the power of the Most High God. Their names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. They've been washed in the blood. They are no longer bound for a devil's hell. They will walk with Jesus from this day forward. Hey, can I tell you what happened to me on Christmas? I got saved on Christmas. Woo! When did you get saved? When did you get saved? Who did you tell about you getting saved? Because that is what Matthew 28 says. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to every creature. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I had a guy tell me one time, you're not supposed to baptize people in the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And I said, well then why does Jesus specifically tell me in Matthew chapter 28 to baptize them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost? Why would he say that? Salvation from sin and death can be ours. It can be your neighbors if you'll just tell him. It could be your family if you'll just tell them. God sent the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to provide redemption for you and for me. It was the message that Isaiah proclaimed in Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 11. It was the same message that Jesus himself spoke about himself about in the synagogue when he declared, I have been anointed to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bow your heads with me this morning. I want you to sing, Jesus loves me. Because you need to know that Jesus loves you. This I know. For my Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so.
Church, Jesus does love you. Jesus has always loved you. Jesus will always love you. And Jesus is asking you this morning, should I come today? Should I step through the portals of glory and blow the trumpet that the dead in Christ should rise up to meet me in the air? That those who remain on the earth would be caught up together with them in the air and go to be with Jesus. Would you be allowed to come? Do you know that I love you? Do you know that I died to redeem you? I paid sin's price with my very life. I died a sinner's death sinless on an old rugged cross that whosoever would believe in me would not perish but would have everlasting life you see because I have made a way where there seems to be no way there is an adversary that hates me and he is trying to convince you that you are without hope that you are without a chance But if you'll listen to my messenger this morning, you will realize that there is a way, that a way has been made. He who believes in Jesus shall be set free. In Christ, you and I can overcome. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. People are praying all over this sanctuary, probably all around the world right now, people are praying, and they're praying for you. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, they are praying for you right now. The angels in heaven are on the edge of their holy seats up there, looking down in the, through the portals of glory, and they're saying, oh, please, church, just believe the message that that preacher preached this morning, because it is true. It is God's Word. And if you're here today and you say, Preacher, I don't know if Jesus would take me to be with him. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right now. Do not wait. Don't hesitate. Just stick your hand up because God wants to get you saved and set free from the powers of sin, hell, and death in the grave. Anybody at all? Wow. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God you're watching by way of the internet right now, may I just declare to you that I, if you raised your hand, I can't see that. But if you raised your hand this morning, it's a very simple process. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Lord, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Write my name in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I will serve you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that simple prayer, you're just as saved as anybody else. And if you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to write a little message. Say, hey, I just accepted Jesus, and hit send or whatever you do there, and get it on, our, on, on the website there where you're watching right now. We want to rejoice with you. I don't know how many people are in this place this morning, but according to, according to the evidence presented to me, which is all I have to work with, every one of us in this room this morning are saved. And if every one of us in this room this morning are saved, can I just tell you that before me stands or sits a very vast army January 1, 2023, the commission from the throne room of heaven is go ye into all the world and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to every tongue, every nation, every tribe, every people, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Before Tammy and I came and became a part of this church and took over this church, 
when we came from St. George, Utah. I didn't know this until just a few months ago. I didn't keep track because to me, uh, numbers are, are, are numbers, but numbers also represent souls. And I never kept track. I never, I never specifically said, I need somebody to, to take, take account of every person that got saved in our church every year. But Mike, do you remember what that number is? Over 2,000 lives changed by the power of the Holy Spirit in 11 years. 2,000. I'm not bragging about that, but I'm bragging on what God can do if we'll just let Him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Actually, it'll be the week after next because it's the second Sunday. Oh, it is yes, the next weekend. Yes. <laughs> See, remember what I said about food? Because the second Saturday is men's breakfast. And after men's breakfast, we always set up the baptismal because it's typically the second Sunday also. But not the case. If you want to get baptized next Sunday, is your day. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, can we give God glory this morning? <laughs> Kathy, sing, sing something good. Let me close this in prayer. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for the anointing that you have uh, released in this house this morning. I thank you for the anointing. Uh, God, I pray this morning that your anointing is like Doug Fur Pitch or like Tacky Lube out of a machine. That once you get it on you, you cannot wipe that stuff off. I pray, God, that the Tacky Lube of the Holy Ghost would get on your people and that it would be a mark on them forevermore, God. Let them take this anointing out of this place and that the people that they come in contact with will be changed by the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And the church of God said amen and amen. Back here tonight at 6 o'clock, we want to pray and we're going to worship the Lord. Amen.